Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better in veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, I-N-V. So I-V-D-I, International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash I-N-V, and we'll get you the information that you need. So Monique has a question. With a tooth that has only a root fracture, would there ever be a time where the tooth could stay? And that's a great, that's a great question. And yes, indeed, a lot of times... And maybe more often than not, that tooth can stay. If you've got a tooth that is undergoing resorption around a fracture, but it's under the bone and there's no periodontal changes there, then that is, is probably never going to be a problem. So that root fracture under the bone level with no perio care or no perio involvement it does not require extraction as long as there's no lucency there. If there is a lucency present, then with that lucency, you want to make sure that it is indeed a lucency and not a chevron sign with a case where you have radiographic changes like the one you're looking at if you're live and the one I'll describe if you're watching this on the pod or listening to this on the podcast, but we've got an enlarged periodontal ligament space around the root segment, which means it's dislodged from the bone and or it has periodontal disease associated with it, destroying the bone adjacent to it. In either case, that tooth crown is probably mobile. And so that would be another indication along with what it looks like radiographically and what it probes as when you probe it in order to make a determination that needs to be extracted. So radiographically, if you can see that there's marginal bone to fracture communication, so where the tooth root and the bone are supposed to be and where the fracture is, there's open space in the radiograph and or you have mobility of that crown those are indications where not only the crown needs to be taken off but that tooth root needs to be extracted whether it has a lucency or not because it's probably going to establish a lucency given enough time if there's periodontal involvement if there's a lucency in addition to that then that means the tooth is already dead and the bacteria have gotten out, destroyed the bone around the root tip. And so that's certainly a definite indication for extraction of that segment. So I hope that answers your question. And we'll go to the next question. And thanks for that, Monique. And Vicky Panos, I'm not completely clear on the indications for extraction based on the x-rays. Is it the pulp cavity that seems compromised apically in Vico? We were also doing this as a podcast, so let me describe what you're talking to and show the people in the workshop exactly what we're talking about as far as the x-ray goes. So this is what Vico's talking about. We've got a fourth premolar. The distal root has maybe a two millimeter decrease in bone density around the apex of that distal root. And the arrow is pointing to that. So if you're listening, you can appreciate what that lucency looks like. And so if that lucency is there, 
back to the question, is there ever a time where that tooth can stay? I'm sorry, Vico, if the pulp cavity is compromised apically, is extraction indicated? And the answer to that is it may be and usually is, but the other alternative is root canal. So you never know. It may be that the client wants to pursue saving that tooth, and if that lucency is just not horrendous, and it's not associated with a suborbital fistula, then with treatment, removing the disease pulp, sterilizing the canal, which is essentially the first phases of a root canal therapy or root canal treatment, and then placing a sterile material in the canal and then sealing that eliminates the thorn in the abscess, right? When you think about thorns in abscesses or foreign bodies in abscesses, if you remove the thorn, the abscess is exposed and drains and then it resolves with or without antibiotics in most cases. So the same thing here, you remove the source of the infection and the tooth stays where it's sterile, the sterile material is not compromised, the tooth or the bone around the tooth root starts to resolve or remains the same and never progresses and there's no dissolution of the apex of the root over time, which we follow radiographically, then that's a perfectly good alternative. If the client does not want to do that, if you have a periapical lucency, there is no instance where you would leave that. You always want to extract a tooth if the owner does not opt for root canal, if there is a periapical lucency around the tooth root. Nice, nice question there. So let's transition to our next question here before we close this case. And this is a good question that everybody needs to know the answer to because we do this a lot. So Kimberly asked about diamond football or diamond burrs. And if we only have one, what do we need? And the diamond football burr would be the one to go that's mainly the larger one that's a canine football burr. Cindy asked a similar question, wondering what size of football burrs that you should have and how you decide on cross-cut burrs. And in, in all these cases, and with the equipment, instruments, courses, whatever, you can also go to drbetspets.com, and that's got everything you need. It's not a hard website to navigate like all the other dental websites that you have to search through hundreds of burrs. We've got everything on one page that we recommend that we use in our practice and that we recommend our students use. We've got some burrs that we use in our practice that we don't you we don't recommend for general practice just because you don't use them that much. But the ones we do have are on here. The feline cross or the feline diamond football burr, excuse me, is a little smaller than the Canine diamond football burr, and it's great for small cats in small places in the back part of the mouth around the first molar. And other, otherwise, canine diamond football burr is medium grit versus the fine grit on a cat feline burr. So you can use that on larger cats or larger areas in cats and dogs. And then we also have that tapered diamond that's a fine diamond that we can use down into alveoli or places that are deeper that are hard to reach. We recommend all of those for the football burrs, for those of you who are doing it dentistry at a volume that is significant where you're doing multiple cases a week. And then as far as your crosscut burrs, the 701L, which is for canine vestibular bone removal, grooves in larger dogs, and pretty much everything from a bone removal standpoint in dogs and large cats. And then for some small dogs and for cats, for making your grooves mesial and distal, that 669 thinner crosscut taper burr is the way to go with that. And Kimberly asked, can you please explain 
vital pulp therapy. And we use vital pulp therapy mainly in cases where there have been super recent fractures that the owner knows that the fracture was at a certain point in time, which almost never is accurate, unless they actually see the fracture as it occurs, look at the pulp cavity and see it's bleeding. That's the only time that we would consider historically doing something for saving that tooth without having to go to a root canal extraction. And I think that's a later question that we have. But vital pulp therapy, essentially what it does, it allows us to either reduce the crown when we've got a malocclusion. For instance, a mandibular canine tooth that's impinging upon the palate and digging into the palate, causing a malocclusion. Or we have a fresh fracture that's less than 24 hours old, ideally, and uncontaminated or at the most 48 hours old. After that, the statistical success rate are very poor, so we would essentially do root canals on those if the owner wants to save them, or if in practice, if they don't, that's an extraction. You want to extract that tooth if you're comfortable extracting teeth that have no perio. Uh, and that's with a surgical flap, bucoperiosteal flap, and the exposure and extraction with using burrs to remove vestibular bone, making grooves, extracting the tooth, contouring the bone with a diamond football burr, and then suturing that close after a radiograph confirms that tooth has indeed been fully extracted. Back to vital pulp therapy, if that's the indication, based on what I just said, where we're trying to save a tooth and not compromise the pulp, then what we would do would be to get down to healthy pulp in the case of a fracture, or we would do a crown amputation in the case of a malocclusion with a sterile burr under, under reasonably sterile circumstances. And we'd remove a couple millimeters of the pulp, depending on how big that patient is, maybe less than that. And then that's going to bleed, so we have to control the hemorrhage. And then we place mineral trioxide aggregate, which is a biological cement, literally a cement that you could go into Home Depot and buy a big sack of. That is the same thing. It's just sterile, and they put it through the sterilizing process, but it's essentially a cement. Or they have liquefied it to make it easily applicable, and that's what we use. And then that sits on the pulp and lets that pulp heal. And then that is cured if it's a, if it's a liquid like we use or if it's just the actual cement itself or the MTA itself, it's placed on the pulp. And then on top of that, we use what's called a glass ionomer generally, or a composite, or both, that seals the restoration, seals the tooth in multiple layers. So that allows that tooth to stay viable, and then we recheck that radiographically every six months or so for a couple times. And if, it, if in a year it's still the tooth is growing, the dentin's getting smaller with the growth of that tooth, and everything is fine radiographically, then we're, we've got a successful procedure. Success rate on those, if they're done with a vital pulp with a malocclusion under pretty sterile circumstances, are greater than 90%. And if it's within 24 hours, probably close to 90%. So that hope that answers your question. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation.